Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're gonna discuss about the Rincolalia Glauca. This is a first time bloomer for me. I have this orchid for about a year and a little bit. And behold, it bloomed and what a majestic flower it is. So today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the orchid, of course about the flower, describe it and also I'll give you a few care tips for the species because it is not a hybrid. You might be tempted to think that Rincolalia is a hybrid between Rinko something, let's say Rinko Silas, and Lalia. No, Rinko Silas is actually a Vanda. A crossing would not be possible. This is a species on its own, but it was reclassified. These orchids, the Rincolalias, used to be Brassavolas. No more. They have a family of their own because they really are distinct from the Brassavolas and even from the Catleas. However, though, they do belong to the Catlea family. I will share with you in the description the link from the orchid species website. They describe it as a warm to cool growing epiphytic orchid native to Mexico, Guatemala and Honduras. And I would have to agree with that. She appears to be absolutely hardy both in my hot hot summers but also in my winter when temperatures were a little chilly. Wasn't all that cold but still pretty chilly. From the Rincolalia family, two of them are very popular in cultivation. To be fully honest, I'm not sure how many members this family counts, but I know of two. The Glauca and also the Digbiana, which I don't have, but I am planning to purchase it at some point. Now, the Glauca bears this name due to its Glaucus nature. And let me show you what I mean by that. If we look particularly on the underside of the leaves, but not only, on the front side as well, on the pseudobulbs, even on the sheets sometimes, we can see a sort of powdery formation. If we didn't know any better, we'd think this is some sort of fertilizer residue or fungicide residue from the nursery, but actually it's not. It is a natural texture for this orchid. And if you google the word glaucus, you can see that it also refers to a powdery bloom which usually forms on plants, such as on grapes. Now why would the orchid produce such a texture? Well, my guess is to protect it from water remaining on the leaves and creating trouble. If you remember, we discovered of a similar texture on the Encyclia vitellina. And as I was showing you there, water simply slides off her leaves. Well, it's pretty much the same with the Rincolalia glauca. And my best guess is that it simply protects it against standing water on the leaves and inside each cane's crown. If water doesn't get contact with the actual tissue, it cannot harm it. If you'd see this orchid without blooms, you would swear it's a unifoliate cattleya. It looks very, very similar to a cattleya, a medium-sized cattleya. As you can see, the pseudobulbs and the leaves are really, really not tall. Also, it is a unifoliate orchid which means it only produces one leaf on top of each cane. The canes themselves are rather tiny in comparison to the leaf and just like other cattleyas, the Rincolalia glauca produces one sheet on top of each cane. In the sheet, the bud will form and in about a month and a half, the bloom completely opens. Obviously, it can happen to have blind sheets, meaning sheets which don't produce anything and each cane can bloom only once, meaning if it bloomed once, it will never bloom again, pretty much like any cattleya. However, the Rincolalia glauca only produces one single flower per cane. You will not have a display of two flowers or more. But the flower, I think, is well worth it, so let's talk a little bit about it. This is not a tiny flower. It measures more than 10 centimeters in diameter. It is almost as big as my palm. It has a little tendency to pull its petals and sepals backwards, but I've seen worse cases than this. It is normal for them to be pulled back. Some individuals are more flat, some are more pulled back. It really depends on your particular individual. The flower, even though it does resemble the cattleya, it really doesn't look like it would be a cattleya, right? We have very thin sepals and petals and also a broad lip. Now the color, the Brassavola glauca is a sort of buttery green, whitish type of color. The lip is lighter in color than the sepals and the petals and it has a nice purpley center. Now color wise you can see it's nothing to write home about. If you see her from a distance you couldn't really tell she was in bloom. Maybe it would get a little mixed in the foliage. Nothing to stand out. Well there's a very good reason for this. This orchid does not attract its pollinators with flashy colors and beautiful blooms, but with fragrance. And because she is fragrant in the nighttime, she really doesn't need all that colors because her pollinators cannot see anything in the dark. They can, however, smell. 
and the fragrance of this orchid, oh my goodness. I'm filming this at 6.30 in the morning, it's still dark outside and I can still smell the fragrance of this orchid. The smell starts to come into play in the evening pretty early and it goes away later in the morning. When it's light outside you can still smell this orchid. And the fragrance is one of the most powerful fragrances I have ever smelled on an orchid. It's that type of fragrance that will kick you out of the room if you don't like the fragrance, you will hate this orchid because she will bombard you with the fragrance at night time. The fragrance itself reminds me a lot of the Brassavolas, but not any type of Brassavola, the Cuculara, which just happens to be my absolute favorite Brassavola because of its intensity and the undertones. So it does have that soapy type of fragrance, but in a very, very good way. There is a touch of elegance with the Rincolalia Glauca, as I was saying, in comparison, let's say, to the Brassavola Nodosa. The fragrance is layered, is complicated, it's not just soapy clean and that's about it. You clearly think of the Brassavolas when you smell her, but it's different, it really is different. And my whole entire and my whole entire greenhouse smells like this orchid. And if I open the windows and I go outside, the smell will come outside and the wind will carry it, and from time to time I would smell the fragrance. That's how strong this is, and it only comes from one single flower. So definitely keep this in mind, be wary of this if you're sensitive to strong fragrances, do not sleep with this orchid in the room. Keep it next to you just so you know how it smells, and let it perfume your home, but don't close this orchid in one single tiny room like a bedroom because, oh, it's gonna completely change the fragrance in that room. Now my orchid had two flowers, but sadly one of them was a little distorted. I have a feeling it got pollinated or something on its own, and in the end the flower simply aborted. I did see when the bud was forming that it was deformed, it was missing the petals, it only had sepals and a lip and it was very fragrant, but it didn't last all that long, so I cut it, applied some cinnamon, and that is that. I would have loved to have two flowers in bloom, but it's okay. I can wait until next year or next blooming time because this orchid is not a very, very fast grower. And now for a few tips on caring for this orchid, I find it to be almost identical to any type of Calia or Brassavola. More to Catlias actually, because Brassavolas, some of them, they tend to look pretty bad in very bright light. They get this red tinge, which is not sunburn, but it doesn't look all that appealing if you overdo it. This one is not like that. So down below in the description you will find the Catlia care video that I have. Those are the basics of caring for Catlias, and if you apply them to the Rincolalia Glauca, it should do perfectly fine, but it does have some quirk. This orchid requires tremendous amounts of light, Vanda type of light, all day long, very bright, not necessarily direct sunshine which can overheat the leaves. What I'm using is a sheer curtain, so a lot of filtered sunlight, not very hot sunlight, depending on your geographical location, is great for the circuit. Some sources suggest that if you don't give it lots of hours of sunlight, it will not bloom. I cannot really tell you about that, I find it to be a very easy orchid to care for and very easy to bloom, but of course I have a subtropical climate, rarely is it cloudy here. So if you've ever had issues with your blooming the Glauca, just put it in sunlight. Make sure that the leaves don't overheat and don't burn, so if you must filter the sunlight, do so. If you don't have to filter it, don't filter it, just offer sunlight. It seems to do great. You can see the foliage on my orchid is not red. It simply just takes the sunlight and is okay with it. She sits in my southern facing window and for most of the day she is exposed to sunlight. Watering wise, well this orchid can drink a little bit. In articles you will see that in organic medium such as bark and sphagnum moss you should let it dry out a little bit, and I think you should. Also if it's mounted again they suggest you let it dry out, I'm not entirely sure about that. They also suggest you water abundantly and very very well because she drinks a lot, that I am sure. I am growing my uh, Glauca in an inorganic medium with Leca, this is the ceramic setup as well, but it has Leca, it has the beads on top to prevent uh, drying out too much, and the roots simply don't mind anything. She does like her water, but I cannot say let her dry out way too much. After the blooms are done, she will go into semi-hydroponics and I am sure that she will like it. 
because of her tendency to actually like water all I can tell you is that in semi hydroponics you don't really need to let it dry out but if you are growing it in an organic type of medium the game is different rules are different let it dry out just like a cattleya other than that, I do find this orchid a joy to grow, particularly if you have warm climates. But considering how good it does in the cooler months as well, in a temperate environment, it would be perfect as well. I think it's a very versatile orchid. All it wants is sun and quite a lot of water. And that's pretty much it. You can see it is quite a showy and appealing orchid as it is. I don't have uh, weird patches of red of anthocyanin on the leaves because of the sunlight. I also don't have spots like on some oncidiums. Some orchids do have a predisposition for spotting. It doesn't mean anything. This orchid doesn't. Pseudobulbs are pretty glossy and nice. They're not very showy, but they don't look bad, leaves are very thick, very fleshy and very very showy and of course the flower is again waxy, thick and sturdy and very very fragrant. Overall, I absolutely adore this orchid and now that I see it does great in my climate and with the care I can provide, I will go ahead and get the Digbiana as well, which is rumored to be fussy. But no worries, this one is rumored to be fussy as well. Now really, if you respect a few requirements that she needs, she's absolutely not fussy. I mean, she went through a repot, a complete change of environment and adjusting to clay medium and she bloomed after a year. I would not consider that fussy. Yes, I started with a healthy orchid, but I would not consider that fussy. I would definitely go for it for those of you who can provide a lot of natural sunlight. And that's about it on the Rincolalia Glauca. So happy to have this orchid in bloom. She is really majestic in person and that fragrance is just the best fragrance for me. So you know the drill, if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos and don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And with that said, I'll see you all next time. Bye.